So many years ago, Henry Ford had a problem at one of his factories. Most of y'all don't need an introduction to Henry Ford, the famous automaker. But in Michigan, he had a large factory, and it went down, and production went down. So, of course, revenue went down, and that's a big problem. So Ford got his team of engineers to come in and look at this factory because the issue was a generator. There was a generator that was not providing any power. So they looked at it, and he had a team of electrical engineers and all kinds of intelligent folks that came in, and day after day, they were analyzing this generator, trying to get it up and running, but they had no success. They couldn't figure out what was going on. Well, Ford's a businessman. He's frustrated because he wants to get this thing running, so he called in the big guns, and he gave a phone call to General Electric because at the time, they had the most famous electrical engineer back then, a guy named Charlie Steinmetz. And Charlie got called in to come to Ford, to their factory in Michigan, because they were hoping perhaps he could solve all their problems. So he shows up, and of course all the Ford engineers, I imagine they're all a little bit offended by his presence, but he comes in there and Ford tells them all just to get out of the way and do whatever he says. And he shows up, they're ready to all work for him, and he said, I just need a notepad and a pencil. And so they gave him a notepad and a pencil, and then he went to go look at this generator, and he studied it for a few hours, listened to, to it, did a bunch of computing on that notepad. But then he came back to him shortly after. He said, I need a ladder and a piece of chalk. And so they gave him a ladder, and he went over there to that generator, and he climbed up to a certain level, and he took that chalk, and he just made a mark on the outside. Then he came off the ladder, and he told all these prestigious engineers, he said, open it up right there and take off the plate. And he said, replace a few specific pieces in there. And he said, it's going to start running again. Well, they were all a little bit offended and thought, yeah, right. But of course, they had to listen because Henry Ford said so. And of course, wouldn't you believe it, that actually fixed the generator. So power's restored. Henry Ford is restored. He's excited. He thanks Charlie. Charlie goes back home. But then Charlie sent Henry Ford a bill. And that bill came in the mail for $10,000. Now, $10,000 is a substantial amount of money even today, but if you think back to then, that was a really significant amount of money. And Henry Ford's a shrewd businessman, so he did not just pay that. He called back to Charlie and said, I want an itemized receipt. Show me why that was $10,000. So Charlie obliged, and he wrote him up an itemized receipt. And the first item on that receipt was right chalk mark and he put one dollar and then he wrote on the next part he wrote knowing where to make the mark nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars and he sent that invoice to Ford and Ford paid it in full because Henry Ford understood that wisdom is incredibly valuable that knowledge is different than wisdom because Ford had a bunch of knowledgeable guys he had all these engineers and all these folks that were looking at it but they couldn't get it done because they lacked the wisdom in that moment. Because what is wisdom? Wisdom is the rightful application of knowledge. It's doing the right thing in the right time, in the right place, in the right way. And they lacked the wisdom that Charlie had, but Charlie was compensated well because wisdom is incredibly valuable. The Bible teaches us this principle. Actually, in Proverbs chapter 3, I wanted to open with this text because it's going to tell you why we're doing what we're doing. But in Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 13, we're told, Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her, and he's speaking of wisdom, is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. We're told if you find wisdom in this world, you're actually the richest person alive. That it's more valuable than gold and silver. That wisdom is ultimately what you and I should pursue at the highest cost. Because we're told by the word of God that it's so valuable. And why is it so valuable? It's because like Henry Ford, we have things that are breaking down all around us. Things are breaking down and we always are looking, how can we get these fixed? For some of you, your home is breaking down, where you're having struggles in your marriage. You're not talking well. You're not getting along. Some of you are struggling with your children, trying to figure out how do I steer them the right direction. For some of you, you'd say, my finances are breaking down. 
Maybe you're in debt up to your eyeballs, or you look at the Wall Street Journal and you see inflation, where it's going, and we're all thinking the financial realm is completely broken. For others, it's maybe your relationships that are broken, because perhaps your words are broken, that your words aren't edifying, and people constantly are pushing away from you, and you're wondering why, and something has to be fixed. And the Word of God offers a great solution in wisdom. That when you find wisdom, you find that which is most valuable because suddenly you are fueled with what you need to take on all of life's troubles. And we're going to look through some of life's troubles over the course of this series. We're going to talk about how do you have a wise marriage? How do you wisely parent? How do you steward finances wisely? We're going to talk about wise words, wise friendships. We're going to talk about a whole lot of wisdom in different avenues of our lives. But before we can talk about any of those specific things, today we first have to talk about the foundation of wisdom. Because if you don't know where to look for it, then you're never actually going to find it. But the Word of God, fortunately, is very clear. Solomon today is going to tell us exactly where we need to go. If we have things broken in our lives that we want fixed, Solomon's going to say it all starts with the same source, that it begins with the fear of God and that the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom and today my hope is that's where all of us in this room will begin this series together so if you have your Bible join me in Proverbs chapter 1 over the course of the study we'll be all over the place in the book of Proverbs but today we're going to start in chapter 1 verse 1 right there from the beginning and I'll read our passage then we'll come back and unpack it starting in verse 1 We're told the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing and righteousness, justice, and equity. To give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. And the one who understands obtain guidance to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and the riddles. And verse 7 is the most important verse today. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And fools despise wisdom and instruction. So our passage opens up. And we're told what this book is and who wrote it. We're told the Proverbs which if you don't know why is this book called the book of Proverbs is because it's a book full of Proverbs and that word proverb in the Hebrew it actually can be translated different ways of course Proverbs as we're talking today but it also could be potentially translated as parable allegory or even a comparison in fact in the Septuagint in the Greek Old Testament they use that same word the writers did of Proverbs that same word is used for parable in many often often in the new testament different places because just as a parable is a metaphor a story oftentimes many of these proverbs are sometimes the proverbs are called comparisons because what you're going to find through the course of the study is many of these proverbs are in fact comparisons they're short statements that compare largely two different groups what the bible's going to call the wise and also what the bible's going to call the foolish And these statements come out contrasting these two different lives. But at the end of the day, what is a proverb? It is a short saying, a short saying packed with wisdom. It's a a statement of truth, and it's a statement of wisdom that you and I can apply into our lives in a practical way. And this book is littered with them. Those short little sayings usually start popping up actually in chapter 10 through 31. 1 through 9, these first chapters really are an introduction to the book and the purpose of wisdom. And then you start seeing the demonstration of wisdom through all these Proverbs in the following chapters. But we're told at the front end that that's what we're signing up for is wisdom, short sayings, practical. But we're told also who's the author. It says it's Solomon If you don't know who Solomon is, he introduces himself. It says, son of David, king of Israel. And Solomon, if you don't know anything about him, he was indeed the king of Israel. But before he was the king, you might remember there was a guy named David who was the king before him. And David, if you remember, he was the famous king, the king that was after God's own heart, that built this Davidic dynasty, this amazing kingdom for the Lord. 
But David was a man that walked in wisdom. But if you remember in 2 Samuel chapter 11, he then chose to walk on the path of folly. Because in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel, he made a critical bad decision. That he chose a woman to be his that was not. And he saw Bathsheba, a married woman from afar, and he liked the way she looked. He called her over, committed adultery with her. He was supposed to be at war doing what he was supposed to be doing as a king. But like many men, he became isolated without accountability, not doing what he should be doing. And then he made a bad decision. And he came across this beautiful woman, Bathsheba, impregnated her, then realized, I have to do something with this issue. So to cover up the scandal, he killed her husband, and then he married her as his own, and everything was great except God knew it all. And God knew it all, and God spoke into his heart and said, I see that you're becoming a fool. And fortunately, David repented. He said, I am a fool. In his own words, he said, create, O Lord, in me a new heart. And he came back to the Lord and got back on the path of wisdom. But as often is the case in our lives, there's always consequences for sin. The devil never wants to tell you that. But there are consequences in that baby that was in Bathsheba's womb. God decided to take that baby directly to heaven. And that baby did not come into this world, and they were grieved. But because our God is a God of redemption, he gives David and Bathsheba another child. And he gives him Solomon. And Solomon becomes the heir to the throne. And he is the next son that God delivers to David to take that baton of the dynasty. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, we're told Solomon's a young man when he becomes king. He's young, inexperienced, yet God said, you're my guy, and he becomes the king. And in 1 Kings chapter 3, we're told Solomon has a little bit of fear and trepidation. Because he says, I've got a big job. I've got a big country. I don't know what to do and how to do it. it. But it says that he was honoring the Lord. He offered a sacrifice that was pleasing. So God accepted that act of worship, and he responded to Solomon saying, You know what, kid? I'm going to give you anything you want. Just name it. Name one thing, and I'll give it to you, Solomon. And can you imagine what you or I would have done if that was us? If God literally gave you a blank check, how would you fill it? If he told you, you can have anything, just one thing, what would it be? But Solomon didn't ask for money. He didn't ask for power, sex, women. He didn't ask for any of that. Instead, he said, God, give me wisdom. He said, I want wisdom. I want to understand. Because Solomon said, if I have that, I can govern well. I can actually deal with these people, and I can lead them as you would, if you'll give me a heart of wisdom. We're told the Lord was, was pleased with that request, so he gives Solomon wisdom, and he gives him all the bonuses. He gives him all the riches and all the others. But he gives, God, gives Solomon wisdom, and we're told in 1 Kings chapter 3 that he tells Solomon, no one will have ever been as wise as you are now, and no one will ever be as wise as you in the days to come. So that means Solomon literally was the wisest person ever to walk on this earth, aside from Jesus Christ himself. And so Solomon is the author of this book, that he has all of this wisdom that God gave him. In fact, in 1 Kings chapter 4, we're told that he wrote 3,000 proverbs over the course of his lifetime. He even wrote 1,000 songs, just because I guess he had some extra time as well. So he was incredibly creative, incredibly wise. Some of it is documented in this book, including the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is not all written by Solomon. There are some other authors. We'll talk about that as we go. But the vast majority of these Proverbs are, in fact, from Solomon, who is the wisest man ever to walk on this earth. And Solomon wanted to pass down that wisdom that God had given him so that we could receive it ourselves and we could walk in wisdom too. And he explains the purpose going back to the text in verse 2. Why do we have this book, you might say? He's going to tell you right now. He says, to know wisdom to know wisdom and instruction to understand words of insight to receive instruction in wise dealing in righteousness justice and equity why do we need this book he says it's so that you can know what's wise and he in fact he calls it instruction so you can receive he says instruction in wise dealing some of your translations will actually say correction or some of y'all might even say discipline in your translation because it all goes together. 
that word of instruction, it does correct us. It does discipline us. It guides us. And Solomon says, God wants you to be guided. He wants you to be instructed. He wants you to know how to deal wisely in righteousness with other people around you. So Solomon says that's the whole reason he's writing this book right here, is to give us wisdom because our first point is true. Wisdom gives instruction to our lives. Wisdom gives instruction to our lives. There are a lot of people in this world that give instructions, but many of them are fools. Many of them give instruction that actually won't help your life. It actually leads you straight to death. But God wants you to have wisdom because wisdom is good instruction, that it will make sense of this world and guide us as we go. But my question to you today is, who's instructing you in your own life? Today, our students took off. They got on a couple buses a few hours ago for that dreaded 13-hour drive to Alabama. So I'm sure they are in movie number one right now, probably, of many others that are going to come on the screens. But I love summer camp, even the long bus rides, all of that. Now, almost every pastor once upon a time before he became a senior pastor was a youth pastor. I'm no different. I love youth ministry. I was a youth pastor. And years ago, we took a bunch of teenagers at my last church to Pensacola, Florida. Similar deal, loaded up the buses, prayed for the best, and then dealt with all the problems of broken down air conditioning and toilets and all kinds of issues. But we got there, and when we got to Pensacola, I had never been there before, and I remember we were on Pensacola Beach driving down the main strip with a normal speed limit. Everybody's just kind of flying through, doing their own deal. But I remember we got past it all, and suddenly the speed limit dropped to 20 miles an hour. And I was thinking, what on earth is going on? Because it's a huge road, big open road, no traffic, no people, no issues. Yet the speed limit was 20 miles an hour. And I had to ask somebody, why are we doing this? And they said, Jonathan, you're going to learn real quickly. Sea turtles are kings in Florida. I said, what? What does that even mean? And they said, well, actually right now it's nesting season for sea turtles. And sea turtles are coming out from the water, and often they'll go across this road to that sand all over there, and they'll make their nests and lay their eggs, and they're endangered, so we're trying to protect them. So you have to drive slow to look for them. I thought, well, that makes sense. That's fair enough. I don't want to kill a turtle either. That's fine. But then they went on and explained further. They said, actually, but it doesn't just stop there. If you look over there, and they pointed, I saw it, there was all these fenced-off areas, black fencing, on the sand that was put together like construction fencing. They said, right there, those are nests. Turtles have already crossed over, and they've already laid their eggs. And those fences are put up by federal employees. And they said they protect the eggs so much so that, in fact, if you take down that fence and you touch those eggs, and even worse, if you break one of those eggs... They said, Jonathan, you're going to be fined tens of thousands of dollars and put in jail for up to five years. I said, good gracious, those turtles are kings, so I can be put in jail for five years. They said, yeah, yeah, you're dead right, absolutely. And I just want to be clear, I'm not anti-turtle. I think that's actually fairly reasonable. I think endangered species, we should protect them. That's great, and I'm all for protecting baby turtles. But something in me just kind of went off. Because I thought, hold on a second. So I can go to jail for five years if I terminate a baby turtle in an egg. Yet every day in this country, we terminate 3,000 humans in mother's wombs. And that's our human right? That that's what we're supposed to do? That we march for that? That we parade over that? That in fact we celebrate it and we chastise anyone else that thinks it's wrong? That somehow we're supposed to protect turtles but kill humans. This is the instruction you're getting in this world. I hope you can see it as clearly as I can. Because some of y'all cannot. And some of you in this room, you have bought in to lies straight from the pits of hell. That there's bad teachers everywhere you look. Some of y'all have been taught a lie by teachers in your schools. That boys can be girls and girls can be boys. That science teachers that believe in science will deny basic human biology on this topic and all of common sense, and they'll tell you you're the fool if you don't buy that instruction. That's why we need wisdom. Wisdom's good instruction because there's bad instruction everywhere. 
There are bad instructors, young people, that are speaking into your life today that socialism is what our country needs, that we need it. It's what's good, regardless of all of human history, showing that it ends in devastating results. There are bad teachers today, young ladies, that will teach you the way you empower yourself as a woman is you take off your clothes and show the whole world. When the reality is you are not empowering yourselves, you're empowering perverted men that are looking at your bodies. But you've bought in to bad instruction. There are people that listen to lies constantly. And people wonder why are we in the mess we're in in our country? It's because we've abandoned wisdom. We've listened to lies. Lies, lies, lies. And my question to you is who are you listening to? Because what Solomon's saying is, listen to me. Listen to the word of God. Listen to wisdom because wisdom gives good instruction. It helps you deal wisely in righteousness that you can do what God has created you to do. But you'll only find it if you listen. And he points to that. Go back to the text in verse 4. He says this book is here to give prudence, it says, to the simple. Knowledge and discretion to the youth... And then he has a charge. He says, let the wise hear and increase in their learning. So Solomon just said, this book's written to a few different groups. The simple, the young, and the old. In other words, what he's trying to tell us is our second point, that wisdom is freely available to all. He says, all of us can receive it. That's why he started with the most basic. He said, I'm writing these, this book to give prudence to the simple. And I love that he said simple. I'm glad he didn't say intelligent. Because most of us, including myself, we're all pretty simple people. That he did not say you have to be seminary educated to become wise. He didn't say you have to have all these degrees. He did not say there's a level of knowledge that somehow is a prerequisite to you becoming wise. Instead, he said simple people can become really, really wise. I, in fact, will tell you I've known some very intelligent people that are fools. I know people that have seminary degrees that are complete fools because they've ruined their marriages, they've ruined their churches, they've ruined their lives, they've ruined their doctrine, and there's foolish people that are very, very intelligent all around us. But the good news of the gospel is that you and I, even the most simple man of God through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, can become incredibly wise. And you are invited into that world doesn't matter what your education is. You can receive wisdom. And then he says, knowledge and discretion can come to the youth. So those of you who are younger in this room, you can be wise. That there is not an age requirement for wisdom. In fact, Solomon himself was a young man that became very, very wise. And I have known young people, teenagers, that have set the spiritual pace for their homes. And I would say they are wise and their parents have been foolish. That that happens Youth, many times, actually set the pace for our world. So all of you young people, if you've ever felt like you don't matter or that you don't know it all, you can become the wisest person in this room. You absolutely can. That God will give that, he says, to the youth. But then it also said for those who are more advanced in years. He said, let the wise hear, in verse 5, and increase in their learning. That God's desire is even for those of you who already are wise, those of you who are already walking with the Lord, those who are already doing all these things. He says, I've got good news for you. You can get wiser. Just listen up. That you can increase in your learning. And that's God's desire for you and I, is that we will live steady lives of fruitfulness and continuously increase in our wisdom. My kids, when they were real little, I probably should pick back up this habit, but we stopped when we moved, but when they were real little at our old house in Houston, we used to do what some of you parents do. We measured our kids against the wall. So you put them against the wall, and you know how it goes. You take the pencil out, and you mark at the top of their head as they're standing against the wall, and then after that, you date it. You put what the date is, and that way we know how tall they were. And why do you do that? It's because in six months to a year, you're going to put them back against that mark, and you're then going to celebrate that they were here, but now they're here, and they've gone up a little bit. And it's amazing how children work, because our children always keep growing, and I've watched it now for nearly 10 years in my household, 
but I've never actually seen them grow right in front of me. I've never seen that happen. I've never seen them go up. I've never seen it, but yet every year when I measure them against where they were, there's always an increase that they keep moving forward. And that is how wisdom works in our lives. As you become wiser, it's not something you're going to wake up one day and say, wow, I'm so much wiser than I was yesterday. That's not how that works. I'd actually say you're being foolish if that's where you're at. But instead, when you walk with the Lord, you steadily grow in wisdom. And it is measurable. That when you look back at your life, God willing, by his grace, a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, you consistently say, man, I've grown so much in wisdom. That that is God's intention, is that we will continue to mature in our faith and understanding. And when you walk with Christ, growth is inevitable. It's going to happen. You're going to grow and become more wise and become more like God has called you to be if you simply stay the course with him. But unfortunately, some of you in your own lives, you if you're being honest, you would say, Jonathan, I don't know if I'm wiser than I was five years ago. I actually went the wrong direction. I've gone backwards. And that too happens. In fact, it's going to happen in Solomon's life, and we'll talk more about that later on. But some of us in this room, perhaps you've gone backwards. And why do people go backwards? If we're meant to go up, why do we go down? Usually it's because something gets in the way in our lives, and it's pride. Pride usually pops up. Because pride goes after the young and the old, and it impedes any kind of forward progress. Because for the young in the room, pride will pop up, and you know what it tells you? It instructs you, all those old people, they don't know what they're talking about. You know what you're talking about. Forget history, forget them, forget anybody else that has anything to say to you. You're King Kong. You know what you're doing, because you've lived all these short years of life. You're in charge. That's what foolishness teaches the young. Pride gets in the way and we say, I have nothing else to learn. I know what's right because I read one article. I know what's right. But then you go to the other end, and I'll go after the older side too. For those of you that are advanced in years, pride can be just as seductive. Because what will happen is someone who's more advanced in years will likewise say, I got nothing else to learn. I hate change. There's no such thing as change. There's only one way, my way or the highway. There's no such thing as anything else other than what I think because there's no other knowledge or wisdom out there. I've received it all, and I'm stuck. I'm, this is where I'm at. Come in my bubble or get out. That is how some people think. And what happens is people start running away from them. People start running away from them. And the reason why is because pride has gotten in their hearts. And the wisdom that God intended for them to grow in got stopped got stumped through pride so my question to you is are you growing in wisdom when you measure your life today to where you were last year five years ago ten years ago have you increased or have you decreased because God's intention is today will be a new day and that from here forward God is going to bring great fruit and wisdom into your life if you learn our last verse for today verse 7 we're told how do we get it where is it found? Verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And fools despise wisdom and instruction. Solomon says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In chapter 9, verse 10, he says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. So Solomon puts the two together, godly knowledge, godly wisdom. He talks about both extensively in this book, and he says it has the same root. It's the fear of the Lord. In other words, what he's trying to tell us is our final point today, that true wisdom comes from only one source. Notice he did not say the fear of 20 things. He said the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge, all wisdom that comes from the Lord. So then what does that mean to fear the Lord? I can tell you first what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that if you're in Christ Jesus in this room, you should constantly walk in a fear and trepidation that God hates you. You should not. In fact, that's not biblical whatsoever. Because you know what John chapter 15, you know what Jesus calls those of us that abide in him? He calls us his friends. He says we're his friends. And Paul says if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. And that anyone that's in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation. So when you and I fall and we do 
sometimes trip up in folly, we need not think in that moment that God hates us and that he's going to come after us because all of his wrath has already been poured out on Jesus Christ. And if you received him, and I say that if because you have to receive him, but if you've received him, you need not fear God in that way that his wrath is going to be poured out on you because his wrath was already poured out on his son. So what does he mean to fear him? What he means is that you and I as Christians every day should walk with a humility saying, you're God and I'm not. It's a constant awareness. It's a reverence saying, he's in control, I'm not. You're really smart, I'm fairly dumb. You're full of wisdom, I seem to trip up. I'm walking with you, you point, I'll march. That, that is the way our lives should be conducted, is saying, you're in charge, I'm not, and my life is devoted to walking in fear and trembling, to walk with you reverently and submissively to your will for my life in this world. And Solomon says, when you get that kind of fear in your heart, and you walk reverently with God like that, the floodgates are open to wisdom. That it just starts pouring out. That God blesses his people with wisdom when they approach him with that kind of posture. But things go south when you just start walking and doing your own deal. I took my kids a few weeks ago to Inner Space Caverns in Georgetown. Some of y'all know what that place is. I actually had gone to it as a kid. Hadn't been there since I was probably their age. But I took them there, and if you don't know Inner Space Caverns, it's what you think. It's a cavern. It's a cave up in Georgetown, and you pay some money, and you go under the ground, and you go look around a bunch of stuff. And we were 70 feet underneath the surface, and it was a pretty amazing deal. We got to look at all this cool stuff and explore and see this. But when I took my kids to the cavern, you know what I didn't do? I didn't just go, like, jump in the hole by myself and go figure it out. Instead, I knew that's a dark hole down there. I need to get some help. So I paid for a guide, and you know what the guide did? The guide led us down into that cave. And what she did is she pointed at things, and she started to explain what was around us. And she also spoke to us, saying, walk this way. She turned on the light so we wouldn't trip, so we had sure footing underneath us. And then we'd come to those forks in the road where you could go different directions. She took us down the right path so that we wouldn't get lost. That she constantly walked with us and helped us navigate through all of that darkness. And how foolish would have I been if I just would have gone on my own. Yet many, every day, take the same approach to their lives. That God's simply saying, I want to give you the wisdom to guide you through all this. It's interesting that wisdom's actually personified as a lady in this book and that she guides us wisdom guides us when we come to those crossroads helping us go down the right direction to help us keep sure footing to help us walk in the light to help us navigate through this dark world wisdom is available to you and I but did you hear what Solomon said he said fools despise it fools despise it because they'd rather jump in the cave and do it themselves and if you jump in the cave and do it yourself, what you usually find is death. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 is one of the most important Proverbs in the entire Bible. There is a way that seems right to man, and it leads to death. In other words, we usually think we know what we're doing, and we're told in the book of Proverbs it's going to lead to death. You might say, what do you mean? Some have had dead marriages because they just wanted to jump in the pit all by themselves. Some have killed their jobs because they would not follow wisdom. Some have killed their relationships with others because they would not follow wisdom. Some have killed their finances because they wouldn't follow wisdom. And God doesn't want to lead us to death. He wants to lead you and I to life. Our God is a God of life. But there's only one way you're going to get there is if you listen to his voice. And when you listen to his voice and you fear the Lord and you say, God, guide me, what he does is he takes your hand and he says, I'm going to help you navigate through all this darkness. And the invitation is there for you and I today. God wants to enter into that world with you and light up your path and help direct you and make sense of all the junk around you. And just like Charlie with Henry Ford, 
He too wants to come into our lives and start fixing stuff. But the only way that's going to happen is if you first lay that foundation of fearing the Lord. Saying, God, you're in charge. I'm not starting today. And when we walk with that kind of posture before the Lord, it's amazing how the floodgates of grace and wisdom are poured out on our lives.